Okay, opponent uh, opening up with e4. Gonna be trying out another rock solid Karo Khan. It is the e5 line. Not gonna be playing bishop f5 in this raiding climb anymore. Gonna be sticking with the Bodvini Karls variation. I think that's how you name this. And against any lines that are not on to c3, we're gonna be going for uh, cd, destroying the center. Playing knight c6 and uh, bishop b5 is what you should expect the most. Knight takes on c6 is also there, but I'll show you an idea of how you should be getting rid of this bishop. And I think most people are playing this line wrong because they want to get the bishop out directly. But it's best to, whenever they play with knight f3, you just literally take and you have to get into the mindset that you're going to be playing with the bishop inside the pawn chain. Same when they take with a queen, you'll have to play with e6 eventually. And after knight c3, you can just uh, go knight e7. That's how we usually develop. Get it to g6, get the bishop, play bishop e7 castle short. And we're going to be having two ideas to actually deal with this. So I think now he's kind of forced to go back. If he takes, that's a pretty big positional mistake. Also defending the bishop. I don't necessarily like this for him because the bishop pair I think should have been uh, given more respect in this situation and I think actually we have a very annoying little move for him because now if he plays b3 there is bishop b4 and I think that actually wins if I could draw any arrows because we need to like only move then there's queen a5 and uh, this actually wins big, not only the knight, but will win the rook as well. This is just jackpot here. And also, like, if he, he had gone uh, castle, there's, like, queen a5. And he's getting murdered on the queen side. And just this. Win the knight, win the rook. It's gonna be up a full rook soon. We may want to look for some kind of play. It is definitely not enough. Just make sure uh, you keep the rook. He doesn't even take the bishop. That's a real man here. Why would you need a bishop when you're down a rook? And a bishop, so... <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I guess just keep the bishop now. No threats. We need to next. Try to focus on this pawn. Like, we're up so much material, it's not even funny. An A4 was found. I'm gonna go queen d2. Mm -hmm. Maybe this idea. Bring the bad bishop back to life. Yep. Hitting the rook. Yes, he's a man of culture. He played a4. For sure, man of culture. See, rook b1. Getting the rook on the safe spot. Nothing's happening. <laughs> man of culture, of course. <laughs> men of cultures also get mated. Eventually, so. <laughs> we get the game. Alright, so we see e4. Just gonna be going for the Karo Khan, and when they play knight f3, either they will take or they'll do this, which is very likely gonna transpose to the advanced variation. And you could do both c5 or bg4. I think bishop g4 is better just because we're kind of encouraging them to play d4. And if they're making the h3 move, we could have taken, and that's already better for us. So now just d6, c5, and we're gonna soon get a transposition to the Bodvini Karls variation after this move and c3, knight c6, and we're basically just having the same kind of positions. It's just that the game started in a uh, different move order and just go cd, get knight towards f5. Always meeting h3 with uh, bishop takes and okay, bishop g5 is actually a pretty common move for uh, lower rated games. Could actually just start with h6 right away. If they keep the pin, just queen b6 unpinning and bring the knight towards uh, f5. 
So queen b6 is actually good square anyways, but even better when the bishop is misplaced there. So uh, bishop d5 is actually so common for these kind of games. Like my student Sam always asks me, okay, what to do with bishop g5? And literally happens all the time. <laughs> He's actually also getting crushing possessions from, from these variations, but uh, <laughs> we have to work a little bit on the technique, let's say. So you can just play knight f5. Actually having a threat of eliminating the knight and then the bishop will uh, remain undefended. So he's kind of forced to play bg3, but then we can at the very least take on f3, cash in the d pawn. Maybe it can start with bishop e7, just to be sure there is no counterplay. Because in some lines, maybe they could sack a piece in the center and get some weird compensation. The engine could come up with such ideas sometimes, so you want to be careful. But I think generally it's just uh, white losing a pawn in this variation and not really any deep engine preppers. <laughs> I was saying, so... Goes knight a4. He's just uh, hitting my queen, but um, either this move, keeping an eye on the knight. Not queen back. Can we go here and say we're kissing the knight, like they say in snooker? Can we guys use such terms? Got a little kiss on the knight. I guess it's not as good as a snooker, is it? The bishop g3, can we just go bishop e7? Can win that like literally any time? <laughs> can also just go for that immediately, play knight e4. So, okay, just collecting the free pawn. We can just simplest and uh, pick this guy up. Then go bishop e7, just uh, castle. Could also play bishop e7 immediately. There's no need to win that pawn because it cannot be protected. But I want to take it because we're fending knight f3. Bishop e7 castle. Oh, sorry. So... One threat that we had in this position, more like a positional threat to take, and then the knight drops, so it would have been forced to take with a pawn, which is even uglier, and okay, just knight c3. Wanna watch out for these type of ideas, but I don't think they're like ever working, and uh, for sake of simplicity could take, but just bishop e7 I think is fine, because the bishop's not running anywhere. Getting ourselves castled and still keeping this annoying pressure on the bishop. So he would like to play queen d2, but that allows again the double pawns. So it's pretty tough to play this uh, as white. <clears throat> and after, yeah, he's trying to now keep the bishop with bishop d3. So I think it's appropriate to now take it after he lost the tempo with it. Just uh, could get ourselves castled. Should try something like f4, f5 if he wants any potential counterplay. Knight b5 won't really do it, I think. Maybe he wants knight d6, but even the knight there is not so amazing. Plus, you have a little idea to try to pin it. He, he has a4, so it's not like a big issue. Um, yeah, actually, maybe 96 is a little bit annoying, not too much, though this can't ever be problematic, but I'm wondering, e6, 96, do we just, like, take it and play e5? Or we can just, like, ignore it and play around it, basically? I think e6 is the move, and we never really fear 96. It's just like a lonely night in our camp. It's basically like a guest. It's basically an uninvited guest. Which we need to take care of. So... <laughs> D5 
1986. We get rid of it. I think that's basically solid enough of a strategy. Again, like, what could Lonely Pawn could potentially do in these positions? Probably not too much. Just gonna attack win. Play knight f5, get rid of the bishop. So... Yeah, okay, queen g4, just knight f5. Keeping an eye on that and maybe simply preparing uh, queen b6, knight d6. Bishop e5, okay, looks promising, but not actually <laughs> having a threat because this is covered. Push d4, rook f1, protecting the bishop. Also play e f f6 if like needed, but maybe just d4. Bishop d4, queen b4, rook a d1. Maybe a bit unclear. But I feel like f6 could be a decent move, maybe. Maybe not. No need to create weaknesses for no particular reason. Maybe just this move with rook c4. If d7, just uh, rook d8 and collect the pawn. No, just uh, use the outpost, hit the queen. So, men of culture. Not sure why he had to play a3. But, uh, I guess he was a little worried about that. And now we have, guys, a really nice tactic, which you can actually try to find by uh, pausing for a bit. So if we take on g4, he can take, and that's only... A trade if we do that but uh, we have a clever way to trade here which is to take with the queen first and we get to win the bishop in the process and then uh yeah we're just gonna be having an extra piece in the end game need to take care of this little comrade here on d7 and i think we're just gonna be having a pretty easy win now let's just say it should be a pretty smooth sailing from now Go on to that weak pawn, play d4, take advantage of the pin, go dc3, play c2. So, okay, opponent resigns and we manage to win the game. It's like we're getting the black pieces and uh, against d4, gonna be sticking with the rock solid Karo Khan and... Looks like we're running against the fantasy, which is actually pretty funny. So, there are actually quite a few ways that uh, you can use in order to deal with this somewhat tricky opening. But for sure, my uh, favorite is to go for the twisted uh, fantasy with e5. And I actually did quite a bit of research on this from the white side because I actually have a chessable course recommending this uh, move for white. So... I'm just going to be going for e5, and most of the times uh, they will take against uh, now, no matter what they play. We're going to go bishop c5, get our queen to b6, and they are going to have a little bit of a problem with the g1 knight. So what usually happens in my students' games, they would normally be getting a pretty quick checkmate. So after queen b6, knight e2 would be a huge mistake here, because that will allow a force mate. But it's actually not so easy to deal with this knight because we are simply threatening to win it. So knight e2 is what most of the people do. Knight h3 is an option. Still pleasant for us after bishop takes on h3. But um, yeah, let's see what opponent has in mind. So he simply takes on c6. Like uh, nothing happened. Gonna cash in the knight. That's a free knight. Bishop's protected by the queen. And we also have... Another little threat of playing queen to f2. So, for instance, like if they go cb, we have a mate. They need to play queen on the second rank, so something like queen e2 is kind of mandatory at this point, but uh, we can just answer that with knight x on c6, and we should be completely winning with the extra piece. 
So yeah, he goes c7, pretty funny, trying to deflect my queen and then win the bishop, but uh, there is the checkmating threat that I mentioned, and that is basically how you just uh, can always win in seven moves against the fantasy variation. If you're playing these in, let's say, games that are lower than uh, 1500, uh, to be honest, I actually even had a student that is like 1800 in rapid and got a very similar uh, checkmate. So uh, I think you can just abuse this trap in all sorts of rating ranges. So, uh, okay, I think you can just go for the next game. Okay, getting the black pieces once again. And against e4, gonna be going for uh, another Cairo Khan. Hey, thank you for the prime uh, iron. Really appreciate it. Welcome, how's it going? So, opponent going for the second move, knight f3. This could be either e5 or ed. It's usually a mix here. They're going e5, meaning that we're going to be getting positions that are similar to the advanced variation. And you could either do c5 or bishop g4. I think both are playable. Personally, I'm more of a fan of bishop g4, just kind of incentivizing them to play d4 uh, a bit more. And against h3 as a rule of thumb, whenever we get into these positions, when they are trying to play like the advanced variation, we're going to be giving it away for the knight. In the exchange variation, you'll see it more of a common theme to step back to h5, but in the advance, usually we're going to be making d straight. So, takes with the queen. Just gonna be playing e6, and after d4, c5 were already slightly better, believe it or not. I have actually checked this position, and we don't even need to gambit the c5 pawn like we would do in the main lines after uh, d4, e5, and c5. Here we get it in like pure form because the bishop covers the pawn. Opponent goes for the check, just gonna block it with a knight. I don't really mind him taking because. We can simply take back with a pawn. Still, there is going to be a small threat of uh, taking on d4. So, expecting him to kind of take. And I would have taken back with a bishop. Against bishop to f4, uh, I think we can simply collect the free juicer, as they say. And, uh, okay, having an extra pawn. Can just continue developing. 97, knight g6. Should be a relatively easy win from now on because we're having the extra pawn and we're keeping a pretty solid position. I'll just uh, do my best here and try to develop as fast as we can with bishop e7 and castle. Whenever they are hitting the pawn on d4, we're gonna be protecting it with c5. So for instance, say they play knight b3, c5 will be played. Just uh, making sure this is gonna be defended and uh, we're having in mind to just castle. Followed by perhaps queen b6, could also throw in this pawn. Just to expand on the queen side, could just do this move. Yeah, so knight f3, told you whenever they do that, we protect with c5. We're having the extra pawn, ready to play queen b6 next, hit the pawn on b2. And problem for my opponent really in these kind of positions is the fact that, well, they don't really have a constructive plan. And okay, you see like c3, only creating additional weaknesses. Now they have... a pretty weak pawn on c3 that we're going to be attacking immediately uh, with queen a5 and okay they probably have to defend rook c1 but then pawn on a2 drops if they play queen c2 we're just going to go like rook a b8 trying to occupy the open file and just eventually make use of it somehow c4 could be an idea to sack the pawn but i think we just grab and even though we're going to be having the double pawns, it should be a pretty good version for us because I think opponent will simply have a hard time regaining that pawn. So, uh, yeah, we see queen c2 as I expected, just trying to activate the rook. Idea is to simply play maybe rook b6 followed by rook b8. Eventually uh, infiltrate using the second rank and then the pawn will be a bit loose. Yeah, just rook to b6. Preparing to double up, idea to infiltrate, and slowly we're going to be having ideas to start attacking this pawn on c3 more and more. So usually as a strategy in the Karo Khan, we just want to make sure that our king is pretty safe and then we're going to be just focusing on the queen side as we do in this case. So just rook b8 in case of takes, we're going to be taking with a queen, 
just uh, keeping full control over the B file, threatening to infiltrate using the B2 square, and then, uh, yeah, opponents will have a pretty hard time avoiding the queen trade, so because we're having the extra pawn, we're just gonna be trying to implement the strategy of trading off all the pieces, and ideally getting into a king and pawn endgame with an extra pawn, which should be like 99% of the times, leading to a book win, but um, we'll see what he plays after queen b2. He could try queen d1, problem with that is uh, the pawn on c3 will be hanging, so he kind of has to go for the trade, not to lose another pawn, but even after the trade, um, yeah, I think we still definitely keep a very promising position. Idea maybe to go c4 and bishop to c5 later on, I think. Just like, you know, try to get the bishop onto this diagonal, hitting the f2 square, activating my bishop a bit. The only drawback of uh, playing c4 is the fact that uh, we're giving away the d4 square for the knight, but I don't think that's like really problematic. His g3 move is pretty bad because it's locking in the bishop. And uh, yeah, just ready to play bishop c5 on the next move. Targeting f2. After that, now that bishop and rooks are on optimal squares, you can think about a way to improve the knight. Maybe get it to c6 even from where it's going to be kind of participating on uh, both flanks of the board. After that, okay, also have ideas to so just win the c3 pawn many ways you can play this and get a win i think simplest would be to just play rook c2 there but okay against knight d4 he's got a pretty strong knight so what do we do with his strong pieces we just get rid of them that's why we play bishop takes on d4 and after that honestly i think c3 c2 rook b1 wins but even simpler just gonna go like knight e7 Just trying to bring all the pieces into the attack. Hopefully getting the knight to the d4 square. And okay, rook a5. So he's definitely cooking up some like rook c5 ideas. That is for sure. Is there any way we can stop it? So going knight c6, knight takes on d4. Would actually run into a back ranker. So... I think simplest is just knight c6 and we can meet uh, rook c5 with rook b6, winning the a6 pawn and making sure that his rook won't really be achieving much on that square. So ju just make sure you don't take us off the back ranker and <laughs> this should be like good enough. Yeah, just g6, h5. Or, you know, don't even need both of these moves, just like create a loop, take this pawn. Uh, advance, whatever point you want. I think I'm going to be taking on a6. And by the way, not sure if you guys noticed, but his rook is actually having no squares. That is pretty funny. Not sure we can use that in any way, but we're going to play this and just go rook b6. And his rook is still trapped. As funny as it may look. And on rook b5, rook b6, we're either exchanging his rook or we're trapping it again, which is like a pretty unique motive, I would say. So I'll just push the A pawn, and there will actually be no way for him to stop it, because the rook has no squares. So yeah, just ignore whatever he does on that side. Okay, when they take, we take back, of course. But we just push the A pawn, and should be getting uh, a queen pretty quickly. So yeah, just ignore. Keep pushing. No squares for the rook. Both of these are covered. The rook is literally trapped in a box. A3, A2 will happen on the next moves. The bishop's also unable to defend. Okay, maybe they could go bishop d2, bishop c3. But it is still like a pretty funny position. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's just funny that his rook is trapped. Maybe we don't have to like just play for the trapped rook. But, you know, it's looking pretty nice. So, okay, I think I'll actually take once here. Play h5, make like a loft. And then we're gonna... Yeah, maybe cash in the d4 pawn. We'll see. Have many options. At this point, you can win with basically anything. That's not huge blunder, like blundering back rank checkmate or something like that. 
or blundering the rook, anything else wins. Just making a loop, then now threatening to win the pawn. Also ideas to push a2. a2 directly bishop c3, because kind of taking care of uh, of that, but now rook b3 should be like easy win. Giving up the knight for the c3 bishop, because we're having the far advanced pawn. Yeah, he could give one check, but not more than that. Now he's forced to go with a passive rook. We're going to be able to take and then play king g6. Can also, by the way, uh, scoop up this uh, h3 pawn. Yeah, just take another free pawn. Could have also gone hg, king g6. I just felt like taking it directly is better. Take this because we also protect the rook. Next up, king g6. Pick up the f6 pawn. And yeah, he's threatening take on f7, just king g6, defending and attacking in the same time. We can literally collect all the pawns. We're going to have five extra pawns. So yeah, opponents <laughs> finally decide to resign and we uh, manage to win the game. Okay, getting the black pieces and going to be going and uh, sticking with the rock solid Karo Khan. And we're running into the classical variation, which is going to be met by the Tarta cover. Just playing knight f6, taking with the e-pawn. This is interesting, but okay, you got to really know uh, what you're doing in order to play this. So I think just uh, taking with the e-pawn is safest. And okay, opponent's playing with c3. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, I don't want the bronze league. I just want to see... My opponent's games. Aha, uh -huh, interesting. Because, to be honest, the only players that are pretty high rated know this precise move order. But we'll see. Maybe he just played it randomly. Yeah, no, he just plays normal. The trick is to play bishop d3, queen c2, and then knight e2. But the way he played it, it's not that critical plus i could try to actually punish him with bishop f4 but i'll just keep it normal go for the pin just play like knight d7 knight f8 whenever they do h3 bishop h5 so in the attack over structure is important when they have bishop e2 we no longer pin but when bishop is on d3 or c4 we go for the pin so uh that's like the only important thing that you need to know in these structures, and whenever they do this, we just keep the tension because it's like super annoying for white. Most of opponents end up playing bishop back to e2. Otherwise, you just play knight f8, queen c7, rook to d8, and we basically take it from there. Pretty tough for white to do any moves. Like some people simply go g4 because the pin is too annoying. Queen c2 would be like common mistake here that even strong players uh, fall for, allowing bishop takes on f3 because the check is not a problem. And yeah, just see what he comes up with. Rookie one is usually like common move for the structure. Just go like um c7 or okay. Now probably he also is gonna take. And we're gonna be getting the really nice uh pawn cube. It's better for him to play something like knight h4, I think, but still. Even that position I think should be pretty juicy for us, and I think I've got a trick in store. I'm going to take on d3, and I'm going to be like, oh no, my knight. Let's see if we can get that on the board. Oh no, we just go for the pawn cube. I actually wanted to do like a knight h4 takes, and then knight c5. Trying to reach e4 square, and if he takes, I would have had bishop h2, picking up the queen. Which is like pretty funny trap for the variation, but uh, okay. Now we just get nice positional advantage. Just go g5, get a knight around g6, and uh, control these weak squares. Maybe if he goes queen d3, we could still have gone for the, oh no, my knight theme. And uh, okay, on queen b3, b5 sometimes could be a move, but he has like a4 and no need to give him a hook. Just play uh, queen c7, protect, knight f8 next, g5 followed by knight g6. No need to do anything fancy, just get a pawn to g5, reroute the knight, and uh, yeah, it's already well known that there's no way to lose when you have the pawn cube, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, okay, let's see. A pretty simple plan. Just, uh, okay, we can ignore it. 
can also play a5. I think we'll just ignore it, just mind our own business and uh, do this. He can push, we don't mind, just play b6. In this case, it's not like in the London where the pawn push is actually like annoying. I think we just have our own play that's way more important to focus on. So d5 could take, could also play c5, and uh, you know, if I go g5, maybe knight d4, knight f5 could be a theme. So I think I quite like c5, controlling d square and just preparing g5, knight g6. Yeah, just going for the standard idea. Getting the knight onto the uh, really nice square, ready to jump onto f4. Not sure about how, how we're gonna do this because. Um, If I go immediately, he can take it. So perhaps I want to do like bishop f4, trade his bishop, and then put the knight there. So that the knight will stay on f4 for good. But maybe even better just play rook e4. Try to double up. On rook e4, knight e2 could be a little annoying, so... Perhaps bishop f4 could be like a good practical move. In general, when you're trying to take advantage of these kind of weak squares, you have to trade off the bishop that's controlling that square. And I think I'm going to try to illustrate that thing now. Because if I play knight f4, he's immediately going to get rid of it by playing bishop takes on f4. But if there are no bishops, my knight will stay there forever, basically. And it's going to be a super annoying piece for his king. So that would be like the most efficient way to take advantage of the outpost, I think. And... I think here he should just play like rook ae1, try to keep good control over the e3 bishop. Because if he takes on f4, it is going to be basically like the decisive mistake, I feel like. To be honest, already I think we have a slightly better position. But it is still not that easy to proceed. And maybe just takes on rook e4 is now pretty deadly because of uh, rook takes on g4 ideas. Yeah, I think I just start with that directly and then rook e4. Threatening rook takes on g4, followed by like queen g3. So let's see. If he plays knight h2, then the pawn on h4 will drop. So I think there's actually no way to protect this. And this sort of aggressive h4 move was... Only making White's position uh, even more vulnerable, so, um, yeah, this is just uh, too strong for us. Depending to just uh, also, like, bring the rook in. White's position is simply having way too many weaknesses, so we have no weaknesses, basically, and that's why. We're going to be winning here, basically. So, uh, yeah, just could cash in the pawn. He has to play like rook g1 now. Stopping my queen from uh, coming onto g3 with decisive effects. And when he plays rook g1, you can simply trade, go for like gh4, pick up another pawn. We have to switch back to like converting mode rather than going all out for the attack. Just have to like... Take this pawn and, uh, you know, bring the rook over, just play slow chess from now on. We have, like, I even lost the count. I think we should be at least to having two extra pawns. Well, looks like we are seven against uh, five. So, yeah, that was right. So, let's see. Preparing to play rook e8. Yeah, e4. Okay, that's also opening up more squares for my queen. Just gonna bring the last piece into the game. Hitting the e4 pawn. Kind of only move rook g4, if you'd ask me, but... Maybe then already knight f4. Could be a crusher. I mean, honestly, anything wins, but just knight f4 to... Make sure that the e4 pawn won't be protected by the rook and... Have pretty interesting uh, ideas. Can throw in a check. Could start with queen f4. Forcing knight back. Then uh, 
24 or rookie four. One of these two. Oh, he just goes back. Wait a minute. This shouldn't be working. We could sack. There's no need to sack. I think sacking is a bit unnecessary. Just gonna play like when H2. Hitting the rook and uh, okay, on queen e3, just idea to bring knight over, knight f4. Could also maybe play knight e5. Usually, sacrificing when you're so much ahead can work only if you are like, you know, sure that uh, calculated everything properly, but generally, it's like pretty unnecessary to sacrifice material. When you can just win by uh, playing strong moves. So that's like dropping the e4 pawn, I think. Dropping it with check, so. Probably will play queen e2 on the very next move, followed by uh, rook c4. Hmm. Is there anything better than I'm missing? I think this is fairly simple. And okay, like I could take the pawn for sinking me one, which is winning, but maybe rookie three is even simpler winning the knight. So yeah, I think just rook c4, king b1, queen e4, rook a4 actually seems to be the easiest way to convert this. It looks like he's dropping the queen now. I was kind of debating whether to take on c4 with the queen and go for the end game too, but this is just way too quick. So, the queen e4, the king has to go into the a file. We're going to be picking up the a4 pawn, and that is going to be resulting in a mating net because he's going to have no squares. So, um, to give up the queen, and uh, yeah, see, that's covered. Now, to give up the queen, otherwise, this is a checkmate. So, so get to win the knight, pick it up with checks. He's gonna try like d6, but uh, now we can just play queen e3, get rid of the pawn. And with that, all of uh, my opponent's hopes for counter play should be gone. So yeah, he resigned and we managed to get a game. Hey everybody, thanks a lot for making it this far into the video and if you're interested in uh, checking out my London system course will be the first link uh, in the description. So thanks again and I'll see you around on the channel. Take care.